Back in the new metal heyday of 1999, it seems like every band out there was obsessed with the nookie or their problems with their dad or whatever. But one band had the courage to release a super fun, really groovy album full of evil disco tunes. That band was Static X, and that album was Wisconsin Death Trip. And I still love it today. So on today's episode of Riff Retrospective, I'm going to take you guys on a guided tour through some of my favorite moments from the album. Hey there kids, it's your good buddy, Uncle Ben. Wisconsin Death Trip came out in 1999 and I'd start playing guitar about a year later, but by that point my brother and I had already been listening to it for like a year solid. So. This was on my list of things that I wanted to learn as soon as I started playing the guitar. I'm always going to have a soft spot for this album because it's still freaking fun to listen to, but also because I have a lot of fond memories of sitting down with my guitar and figuring out how to play these songs on my own. This was of course back in the dark ages before we had YouTube and guitar tab sites and all that jazz. And honestly most of the tabs that you find online now still remain inaccurate to this day, especially in regards to the tuning that the band uses. We'll talk about that as we go along. But these simple tunes with their repetitive riffs were just a great place for me to learn how to start using my ear and figuring out songs on my own. Today's video is brought to you guys by everybody who supports my channel over on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Sign up today for all kinds of bonus goodies like exclusive videos, backing tracks, downloadable tabs, and so much more. This week everybody who supports my channel at any level is going to get tabs to go along with this lesson, so don't delay. Sign up today. Gear-wise for this video, I'm playing this Woodwright Warlord guitar that they just sent over to me. This thing is awesome and it came from the factory in the tuning that Static X uses anyway, so it just seemed like a great excuse to put this thing to use right away. Really awesome guitar. I'm playing this through the Synergy PV6505 module. This thing is awesome. It just hit the market and it delivers the crushing and classic tone of the 6505. And to make it sound even more aggressive and tight, I've got the classic Boss SD1 running in front of this as a boost. Here's what it sounds like without the boost engaged. Now here it is with the SD1 out front. Toy like a toyga. Like most of us, Push It was the first song by Static X that I ever heard, so this is one of the ones that I wanted to learn right away. Now back in the day, I assumed that all the songs on this record were in drop C tuning. And that's what you see a lot of the tabs online telling you, is that they tune C, G, C, F, A, D. And uh, that is actually inaccurate. So I found out years and years and years and years later, through getting to know their former guitar tech, Eric, that the band actually tuned to C standard, which is what this guitar came tuned to from the factory. That's two whole steps down from standard tuning. That means on the bottom we have a low C, F, A sharp, followed by D sharp, G, and C. A lot of these songs are playable in drop C tuning, but not all of them. And that definitely kind of caused some confusion whenever I was figuring these songs out back in the day in drop C tuning. The majority of the song is based around two power chords, your low C and your low E flat. It's really simple and repetitive, very machine-like in a way. And one cool thing that they did with this is in the chorus of the song, for the back half of it, they just reverse the two chords. So instead of being it turns into this. I wish that I wrote stuff that was that simple. I'm always trying to like overcomplicate stuff and add more to riffs and make things more technical or whatever. But at the end of the day, riffs like that will stick with you forever because they're just so easy to remember and groovy. Now let's talk about the second track on the record, I'm With Stupid. The 
whole riff is two notes, C and D flat. So you got an up high, then they just turn it into a low chunky power chord thing with the vicious palm muting. I remember back in the day, this is one of those records that really motivated me to get my rhythm playing sounding really aggressive and mean. Because even if you have like a really heavy tone dialed in, if you're hitting light, if you're palm muting light, that stuff doesn't sound like it does on the album. It sounds like this. I mean, just what a difference it makes just to dig in harder and palm mute harder. One thing that I really like that they did with this tune too is when it goes to the verse, the entire thing just comes up by a half step. That way the riff is based on your D flat and D power chords like this. I feel like most bands that tune low just become super obsessed with always like flobbing on whatever that low string is all the time. But this record features a lot of riffs that don't just focus on that low C, so it doesn't get too repetitive. Also just think there's something about like raising a riff up, you know? It's kind of the classic Metallica trick. They would take a lot of the riffs and just come up a whole step just for some added tension. Plus it makes it sound all the heavier whenever you do finally go back to that lowest note that you have available. <laughs> My brother and I always really liked the little samples that they put in this song too with the shall I grab my shovel part and all that. I have no idea what that's from, but it always cracked us up. I just like that they did stuff like that to show you that it wasn't all just gloom and doom and brutality. So many bands in this era were just so obsessed with being as dark and as you know depressing as possible. But this stuff came out and it was like a, a breath of fresh air because it's fun. I feel the same way about like Tonight the Stars Revolt by Power Man 5000, which is another record I've been listening to a lot lately. Um, don't dare me to do a riff retrospective on that because I totally will. I love that album too. Let's talk about Bled for Days. Again, another super simple one just based on a couple of chords. Here's how the first riff sounds. So we can see that it's mainly based around this D power chord, and he gets into it with that open low C. But then here at the end, there's two palm muted open strings, your uh, low C and your low F strings. I'm not really sure why that's there, but I like the variety that it adds in with that kind of, it's like an inverted F kind of sound there for a second. Uh, again, there's a lot of debate in the tabs and stuff about how that riff actually goes, but from all the live footage that I've seen, that's what it looks like is going on. The guitar tone on the record is really gainy and really scooped, and there's a lot of other electronic stuff going on, so it's a little hard to tell at times. But from the live videos that I've watched, that seems pretty accurate. Um, live videos, too, by the way, totally puts to rest any debate on if they were using C standard or drop C. You'll see zero one-finger power chords in their older stuff. They tuned to drop B flat, I think, later on, but especially for this you know, era of the band, if you watch any of the live videos, it's all standard power chord shapes. And again, by focusing on that higher D power chord, it makes it all the heavier when it goes to the next section, which features that big, nasty low C. There's also a really odd effect going on with this riff, and maybe it's just me, but I've always heard this riff as sounding like this. It's definitely not that though, but for some reason in my head, I can think about it long enough and make it sound like that again. It's kind of like the, uh, you guys remember that thing that floated around online a few years ago with like the, the dress that's like, is it black and blue or is it white and gold? And you could kind of look at it one way and it'd change. It's kind of sort of like that with me. But what I've come up with here is uh, pretty sure what's going on with that riff. Next tune I want to talk about here is Love Dump, which is another super repetitive, super easy two note riff that just grooves so hard. Check it out. It's two notes, it's super repetitive. But it almost kind of makes you think about the kind of things that Wayne was probably finding on those sequencers and stuff that he was writing this music with. I saw a, uh, an interview with him and uh, Koichi that was in the band originally, 
and they were talking about their writing process and it's so it's so surreal guys because like you know nowadays everybody has like a home studio with logic or garage band or whatever but back in the late 90s that that was not common whatsoever and uh, in this interview he was talking about some of his favorite pieces of gear to record with and it's so insanely primitive guys like it's kind of ridiculous uh, but yeah, again, like that robotic sequenced kind of thing is what riffs like that make me think of. It's like simple little loops that you'd have in dance music or something. Now again, that riff right there kind of resolves around that F note that we have. And the thing that I like about it is it hangs on that for so long that you kind of forget that the guitar is tuned down to C. And then the next section of the song goes to that really heavy low C. The transition is dope. It sounds like this. I Am has always been one of my favorite tunes on the record, partially because I'm a real sucker for any riff that's not even based around notes. It's just this like percussive, muted string thing with like a really slow moving phaser over the top of it. I'm gonna use my little MXR Phase 95 here to demonstrate. I don't know if Wayne was like a Van Halen fan or anything, but for me, whenever I heard that riff, it kind of took me all the way back to like. You know, that kind of thing. And again, it's based on a super simple repeating pattern with zero variations on that rhythm. Very mechanical sounding. Now, the next riff in the tune, I think is really cool too here. It uses the fifth fret harmonics on your second and third strings. I see people play this all kinds of like different ways. But uh, again, if you watch the live videos, it's all based around a uh, open position power chord and then chiming out those harmonics on the fifth fret. Here's how it goes. I think the chorus riff of this song is one of my favorite on the entire record. And again, it's dead simple. You got a root, you got a flat seven, and you got this little climbing chromatic power chord thing. I think a lot of us are guilty of looking down on really simple riffs like that, but the way I look at it, man, riffs are kind of like tools. It really just depends on the situation as for what tool you need. Sometimes you need the world's most advanced supercomputer to solve a problem. Other times you probably just need a hammer. Riffs like these are hammers. Sweat of the Bud is probably the fastest song on the record. It's got this really intense kind of build up at the front and then it hits us with just a really simple chugging C power chord riff. <laughs> And that's cool and all, but I think the real star of the tune is the next riff, which is based around some harmonics. A dream theater riff, it isn't, but it does require a lot of precision and consistency to get those harmonics right, because those harmonics do carry a little bit of a melody to them, and if you hit the wrong harmonic, it really doesn't sound right at all. That was like take five that you just saw right there because I was struggling to get them exactly right. They're all kind of centered here around the third fret of the guitar. And they're kind of those like fractional harmonics where you're not really right above the third fret. You're kind of on fret 2.6 or seven. There it is. Because what we want is to hear the sound of a flat seven. So we hear in the C, then we hear it's flat seven, B flat. Sounds like it's down a whole step. And then the second harmonic I'm getting by playing right above the fret dot. So it's kind of like fret two and a half. 
And then you gotta go to the left just a little bit, like right above that second fret to get that one to sound out right. It's kind of a balancing act because your right hand has to be really aggressive and assertive and the left hand has to be really light when playing those harmonics or else they won't sound out right. Last one I wanna cover here is the title track, Wisconsin Death Trip, which again starts off with another riff that's just based around noise, just muted strings. But it's all filled in so well with all those different loops and the drum beat and everything going on behind it. The guitar's doing basically nothing there. But I think it shows just how like imaginative the band was when they wrote this stuff to hear the potential of all this stuff going around. Like I would do that and not think there was anything to it and throw it in the trash can. But to develop all those ideas around it and make it sound cool, that really does take a lot of creativity. Now the verse of the tune takes place around this F power chord again here at the fifth fret. Again, really simple stuff. And uh, it sounds to me like he's grabbing that, that octave. And again, it's mainly based around that F right there. So our ear begins to hear that as kind of the tonal center and ignore this big low note going on later. So whenever it gets to the chorus of the tune and we go to that simple variation, again, it's the same rhythm, just slightly different movement in the chord. It sounds like this. Sounds like there's some kind of like an auto wah or something on one of the guitars too. There's like a weird texture going on right there. So again, our ears hearing this F is the center. And then verse two happens. Chorus two happens. So our ears have really gotten accustomed to that. And then they go down to. like the same riff, but way lower, and it suddenly sounds super heavy. Again, I love that effect, hiding your low note until later, then unleashing hell. I think that always adds like an element of interest and surprise heaviness to a tune. So there you go, guys, a deep dive into the coolest riffs from one of my favorite albums of the late 90s. Again, it's dumb, simple, evil disco fun, this record taught me a lot. It taught me to learn how to trust my ears when I couldn't rely on my, you know, guitar teacher or my guitar magazines or whatever to provide the answers for me. This is one of those records that really inspired me just to try to figure it out on my own and gain confidence in my own playing and my ears. Let me know what record you guys like to see featured on the next installment of Riff Retrospective down there in the comments. I have a lot of fun doing these videos, so let me know anything you guys would like to see and we'll cover it on the next installment. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell for notifications, all that good stuff. And also support my channel over on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Well guys, it's been fun as always, but now I recommend you guys get off here and go mash some rope. Oh, and watch some live videos of the band too from like back in their heyday in the late 90s and early 2000s. Seriously, they sound unbelievably great. Like Wayne's vocals are so perfect that it's kind of insane. He sounds exactly like the record. And so does Tony on bass too. His like backing screams and stuff sounds identical to the album. It's pretty amazing. Anyway, less clicking, more picking.